<laughs> he had to remind himself, who's the speaker? <laughs> Uh, welcome to uh, RA seminar. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Matt Mason. Uh, I think he's someone that really doesn't need an introduction, but I think demands one for me. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, so let's, see, let's, let's talk about Matt. Uh, without a doubt, and this stuff only semi embarrasses him not all the way, but without a doubt, in, in academia, you know, he has had you know, perhaps one of the greatest impacts on on academic robotics life than any other uh, uh, researcher and educator. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> if you look at his students you here too that early. his group has generated, they've all gone off and done, what's that over again? No. They've gone off and started, <laughs> uh, they, they've gone off and done very well, uh, uh, both in academia as, as well as in industry. Uh, look at the number of best paper awards that he's had, although when I first met him, he, one of us are nominations for best paper, but then after I met him, he started pushing it over the best paper awards, probably perhaps. Uh, uh, you, you name it. Uh, of course, he also served as director of the Robotics Institute and has given you know, several, uh, several talks with nothing but full of wisdom and as such. Uh, his career has impacted me personally. Uh, not only in my thinking and how I uh, 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 do research, but also how I mentor my students. I'm also, it's a good fun fact, I'm the first person that Matt Mason hired into the Robotics Institute. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> now normally when you give these kinds of introductions, it's customary to figure out something embarrassing about uh, the speaker and then you share it with, with, with him, with, with the audience because you know, it kind of puts the speaker on edge, and uh, <laughs> off you go. The thing is, I don't think anything embarrasses Matt. <laughs> so, so, so that's a problem, okay? Uh, so maybe I should just share you know, you know, a couple of thoughts in my head of, of, of when Matt and I first met, but one thing he once said is I had to give, it's unfortunate story of this part, I had to give a, 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 a little a speech at a funeral, and afterwards, uh, you know, Matt made a comment that, uh, well, I guess if I go, I, I'd like to how we give that speech. Uh, so it would be an honor uh, if the time comes before uh, that I do that again. Okay, cool. Okay. So with that, I'll leave Matt uh, uneasy and, and uh, look forward to a great summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm told that the COVID protocol says I can take this mask off if I stay more than six feet away from all those people. If there are no objections, do I need to ask if there are objections? We, we got by, we got by split game rules here. <laughs> so okay. Okay. If you're thinking of rushing the stage, if this were a stage, okay, keep in mind, I'm not wearing my mask now, so. Um, it's, I am vaccinated and boosted and I took my uh, tartan testing. Thanks for arranging that and that, that came back negative. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we're good. Um, thanks for the great introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you. This is definitely my favorite venue. Um, I've given uh, several talks at CMU over the years. Not all of them were very good. Uh, the most memorable was uh, when I was applying for a job and the audience there was about five or six people there. And I remember Scott Fallman was there. I don't imagine any of you know him. Some of you do. Yeah, I, you know, every year we honor him because he invented the, uh, the, the, the smiley icon, right? Um, he was there at the talk, and I learned something important from him, which is if, I mean, when I finished my talk, it was just dead silence, okay? Nobody had anything to say, no questions to ask. And then uh, Scott said, uh, well, what's next? And I, I realized that's a question you can ask at any talk. You know, you can sleep through the entire talk <laughs> and wake up and there's a dead silence and you can ask that question. It always works and I've used it many times. So uh, don't, don't forget that at the end of this talk, we might need it. 
but it is a thrill to be here. This is my, this is my professional home, and uh, it's been very strange to be away for, for so many years. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming anyway. The, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, Berkshire Gray. Um, this did not advance. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Even the simplest things now I could screw up, huh? So we're going to start by watching this by watching this video, and I'm leaving the music on. A lot of the videos are going to have them off, so I can talk over them. We're going to watch this twice, so we'll watch it once with the music. I hear the music. Do you all hear the music? So obviously this is a promotional video. So it's at a FedEx facility. So Berkshire Gray's. Uh, installed. I'll talk later. Okay. Okay, so we're going to look at it again, and I can pause it, and we can talk over it. And if you have any questions about what you're looking at, just speak up, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff packed in here. Uh, the first point is it is at a customer facility, so uh, uh, all, the, all the videos I'm going to show in this talk except one, were actually at customer facilities. So FedEx, um, you know, the packages come in on trucks. They come in in these bags. Uh, this lady is uh, dumping that bag into the hopper, and that's when the robots take over. Uh, that's a little user interface there. So uh, it's a big assortment of things, right? There's very little control over that. It's mostly just anything that's small enough that, that comes into the facility. So envelopes, bags, uh, mailing tubes. Some of the mailing tubes are, have a triangular cross-section, which is kind of weird and hard to pick up. Uh, now what's happening here is the robot picks them up and then it drops them through this thing called the hyper scanner. Uh, now, that's a, that's a Berkshire Gray thing. Everything here is a Berkshire Gray thing, and I'll come back to that later, but it's not, you know, they're not just making robots, they're not just making conveyors, they're doing the whole system. Uh, that thing there is, uh, we call that the linear sort wing, and so a, a package gets dropped into that uh, shuttle, and that shuttle goes back and forth and sorts it into, into a bag. Now this, Oops, I forgot how to pause. Oh no, now we have to see the whole thing again. Where were we? Somewhere right. Uh, yeah, those bags. Oh, I did it again. Let me concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> K, K, not space, K. K, that's it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so 
every, you know, those look, those are identical with the bag that, that arrived. So, you know, the bag comes, uh, it gets stuffed into the machine, then the machine sorts it to a whole bunch of different bags. Each of those bags is going to be loaded onto a truck. And so you're right, it could be zip code, uh, but it could be broader than that. It could be a state. It may, you know, I don't actually know exactly what FedEx is doing here. But uh, the reason I stopped here is that uh, I, I, just, I just think it's interesting and kind of ironic. Almost all robotic manipulation videos, sooner or later you'll see a human doing something. And the human's awesome. Right? The human is a uh, hundred times better than anything the robot can do. There's no way a robot can do what she's doing right there. Grab that thing and gather it up and make a knot out of it and pull it out and toss it somewhere. Um, and I just think it's funny that, you know, we make a video where, you know, we're trying to brag about our machines. And in that very video, we show the competition basically just totally kicking our ass. And nobody thinks anything of it. We're, we're so used to seeing humans do amazing things. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll let it go. Uh, so, yeah, look at that. Can you imagine a robot doing that? I, I mean, like we'd, we'd like to get there someday. So is there a bottleneck in the system? The human? The person trying the bag? Well, it, I mean, it could be. I mean, the whole thing is engineered you know, dealing with the human characteristics is part of the system. So, um, you know, every, I think everybody that, that's doing systems work, they, you have to take human factors into account. We had a bagging Olympics uh, at the office once to, you know, all of us taking our turns bagging things and figuring out sort of how fast could you do it, who is fast at it and why and so forth, yeah. So that just begs a couple of questions for how do you do it? Poorly. <laughs> The motivation for research. Uh, but, but my question was, uh, and maybe this, this part's naive, if you had a mechanism that can tie the bag for you, would that have sped up, would that, would it, would that could, you think it could have a significant impact? I, guess the I mean, we, we would do that if, if, if we could, right? I mean, there's a question of where, where you draw the line, and, you know, and that line's going to move as time goes on. Um, but that's a... Uh, that's a pretty good place to draw the line right there. We can drop things into bins and into bags and so forth. Uh, it would be a technological challenge, you know, to push the line further right now. Yeah. Yeah, all of those things are in play. <laughs> it's my daughter. Sorry, Kate. <laughs> um, Question, I have a question. When uh, somebody in the audience asks a question, can the uh, Zoom people hear it? Or should I repeat it? Um, it's probably helpful to repeat it. As long as Howie does it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Those of you who are known, known big mouths will be fine. But <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> well, OK, now that I have your attention. Yeah. The robots don't do anything the way humans do. And a robot would just heat seal that bag and use vacuum to suck it up. And there'd be no problem doing that. So to say the competition is beating us is, is a little odd because they're kind of going right past each other. They're doing completely different things or in different ways. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> um, there's a question at the back. Of course, you know, this is the, this is the first video, and we've got a lot. Uh, but what's the question? It's actually more of a comment. Is that from, I, I've worked a bit with some warehouse stuff, and often the humans are like, correcting small mistakes as well. So at the very end of the process, it might not just be the tying operation that needs to be solved in order to make that work. Right? The human's also moving the bag, stretching a new, like, yeah. It's not just that manipulation task that they're doing that's important. That's a good point. Thank you. And uh, uh, for the Zoomers, uh, I'm not going to try and summarize. I'm going to I'm going to zoom on. So uh, I'm going to try and keep going. Uh, so here's the plan for the talk. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to tell you my story, uh, which is going to be very brief. Uh, and then I'm going to back up and tell you the Berkshire Gray story. And then uh, talk a little bit about the vision that uh, led to uh, Berkshire Gray. And then what have we learned about manipulation? Try and talk about at least a few le lessons. Show you some more systems. And then we'll be done. So uh, it seems like a lot, given how long it, it took me to, pass, to go through that first video. <laughs> um, so my story, you know, before Berkshire Gray, I was doing manipulation research, mostly here, right? I did uh, it in grad school, and then I came here. And it was pretty much, uh, you know, there was one topic. I worked on compliant control. And then for most of my career, uh, I worked on mechanics and manipulation. There's this textbook, which many of you have been uh, tortured with. Um, but you know, don't blame just me. Actually, I stole a lot of material from the students who were taking the class to develop the textbook. So uh, you can share some of that uh, credit or blame. Um, the interesting thing about that, as far as this talk is, there was, there was nothing in there about either business or logistics. And here am I now giving a talk about a logistics business and, and so why, and, and, and why would you come? And I have two ideas about that. One is that uh, my experience has been that a lot of times you can learn a lot from somebody that's just learning themselves. It's easier to learn sometimes from a, from a beginner than from an expert. And especially, uh, you know, I see that happening when, when students would come to office hours. You know, a student might ask me a question about a class I'm teaching, and I would give them a, an answer and, uh, and the student would nod uh, with that blank stare. And then the student next to him might give like a five second answer and the student would say, oh, I get it. And, and we would move on. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this phenomenon. So you know, in this case, I'm the beginner and I'm trying to pass on some things that I think are interesting. So maybe that will work. Um, if you're looking for something more authoritative on this topic, there is a nice uh, online, free online textbook. Uh, it's up to like, you know, version 0 0.98. And uh, when I have a question uh, about some uh, issue, uh, that's where I go sometimes. Well, let's see. OK, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, before Berkshire Gray, uh, as far as commercialization, of autonomous manipulation, I was mostly a skeptic, OK? I had managed to stay clear of business for pretty much my whole career. Now, the word autonomous is key here. So you have factory automation, OK? And that's a winner. That's autonomous manipulation in its commercial. It's very successful and very important to our field. Uh, and then what is there besides that? Some people would say surgery, but, but uh, that's mostly teleoperated. Right? It's uh, mostly not autonomous. Uh, so there are all these visions that people have talked about over the years. Uh, manufacturing, yeah. Uh, Bill Gates wrote this nice essay, Scientific American, saying we could all have uh, robots in our basements folding laundry. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. I'm not holding my breath. And, and then there are many others, right? Everybody's got a favorite, you know, the home butler, cooking, vacuuming. Oh, vacuuming actually worked. Uh, the Roomba is an autonomous mobile manipulator. People don't think of vacuum as manipulation, but you know it's 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 picking up tiny little bits of stuff and moving it to its stomach and then moving it to uh, a rubbish bin. So uh, so that's a good one, I think. Uh, the most prominent one was when Google acquired all those uh, companies. I don't remember when that was. Five years ago? Ten years ago? And it seemed that Andy Rubin, uh, who was leading that, had some grand vision of robotics that he was going to put all those companies together. And we all speculated on what that vision was. And we're still wondering, right? That I, I, I don't know uh, what that was. But anyway, that's where I was. I was a total skeptic. And then what happened was that Tom Wagner, who is the founder and CEO of Berkshire Gray, he came to CMU, came to my office up there in the fourth floor, and, uh, and we talked for two hours, and, and that was it for me. I was converted. And uh, you know, the word for this sometimes can be an epiphany. And 
Uh, yeah, this is a, a little bit blasphemous, okay, so I apologize if I'm offending anyone, but, uh, you know, there's this story in Christian lore that uh, St. Peter, is it, was on the road to Damascus, and uh, God uh, struck him with uh, an epiphany, he had an epiphany, he saw the light, he was converted to Christianity. Did he become the first pope or something? Like, I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so apologies again. That's Tom Wagner playing the role of God, okay? TW up in the cloud. And this is me uh, just minding my own business when zap, he hits me with this epiphany. And it was uh, May 6th, 2014. Uh, I was converted in two hours, okay, or, or less. Um, and so that, that's the key event in this whole story. So, so let's back up from there, because, you know, how did Tom Wagner get there? Um, Berkshire Gray uh, really started a few years earlier. So Tom Wagner had been the chief technology officer at iRobot. And before that, he'd been a DARPA program manager, and he'd done some other things. So he leaves iRobot, and he fills up a whiteboard with 45 ideas, and then he starts plowing through them, working through them very diligently, visiting places, talking to people, trying to find the right one, the best one, where technology can be pushed and the market can be pushed to a point where they come together. And, uh, uh, and, and he did that, and that's the vision that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, so that was, you know, 2012. He uh, uh, founded BG a year later. Opened an office in uh, Boston, recruited a couple of guys to work on prototypes. Uh, and then it was a year later that he came to Pittsburgh, recruited me and several other uh, Carnegie Mellon alums and faculty. So, you know, Sid Srinivasa, Pras Kabuti, some others. Uh, and we had an office right there on Craig Street, okay? Uh, later moved to Washington's Landing, and now the office is in Sharpsburg. So very close here and full of CMU alums, not just CMU alums. Uh, four years later, so the long time that we were in stealth mode, I, I didn't even know what stealth mode was, right? I, I really didn't know much about business, but I, I learned that that means you keep your mouth shut. So <laughs> it's the exact opposite of, of life in academia. So uh, it was hard, it was hard. Uh, a lot of people guessed what Berkshire Gray was doing, but we couldn't tell them that they had it right. We just had to, like, you know, keep the mouth shut. And, uh, uh, but we came out of stealth mode in 2018, and then just a few weeks ago, a month ago, July something, a few months ago, we listed on NASDAQ. Now, when that happened, of course, we were all very excited, uh, but I was talking to a friend, uh, Oliver Brock, on the phone about this, and he said to me, you know, that's the first IPO of a robotics company since iRobot, which to me was a shock. Uh, it's hard to believe that 16 years had passed without a robotics company, what some people sometimes call a pure play robotics company, going public. Uh, but that was the first one uh, since iRobot. And the accountants, the value of the accountants attached to it was 2.2 billion bucks. So, you know, that, of course, was sensational. When we started, that was one of the accomplishments we were dreaming of producing. But when you get there, it's different, right? It's, it's not an end. It's a, it's a beginning or it's a milestone along the way. And so this is really just the beginning and there's more to come. Uh, so that's the Berkshire Gray story, my story intersecting with Tom Wagner at the Epiphany event. Okay, so I've told you everything except I haven't told you what the vision is, and obviously uh, you've already guessed it, uh, it's, it's warehouse automation. Um, and I say warehouse automation, but there's just not ex the right word for it, so it's not just warehouses, like that FedEx facility isn't a warehouse, it's a, a parcel post distribution center. So there's a few different kinds of facilities, and we can just lump them all together and call them warehouse automation or logistics. Um, but the real question is, you know, how could this be a surprise to me 
in 2014? Uh, how could that epiphany event have happened? How could I, how could warehouse automation be a surprise? And, because um, uh, I think probably it wouldn't surprise any of you now. Uh, there's a lot of companies trying to do it and it seems like a, a winner. Uh, well, in 2014, um, the thing that uh, had happened in robotic warehouse automation was Kiva. Kiva Systems had built this really brilliant system with these uh, uh, little courier robots that scoot around and get under a shelf and pick up a shelf and they move the shelves to the humans where the humans pick the orders. And Kiva had been purchased, had been acquired by Amazon for something like 750, 780 million dollars, okay? And so now, the way I saw that was, wow, that was a great application and, and, and Kiva nailed it. You know, I wonder what the next great application will be. And uh, so I had no idea how big warehouse automation is and how much was left uh, even after Kiva. And so that's how it could be a surprise. And uh, you know, I, I've talked to other people that had the same kind of perception. So uh, warehouses, it's still, a great, uh, it's still a great application. If you go to warehouses now and look, very, very few of them are automated. They spend an enormous amount of money on labor. Um, all of the picking that goes on in warehouses, almost all of it is done manually by people. And there's picking happening at many different just stages uh, in a warehouse, not just uh, the one that, that Kiva automated. Um, now, another factor in all of this is, of course, e-commerce, because e-commerce is putting this enormous pressure driving, pressure driving this trend so that uh, you know, the warehouses are growing, right? Labor is shifting from the consumer to the distributor, and so they need more warehouses. They need more picking, right? And they need it desperately. And uh, in, in fact, a lot of them view this as an existential issue, and there's no surprise there because like, for example, Sears failed, right? Uh, strong brick and mortar retailers uh, have gone under because of this whole process. So uh, uh, that's the vision that Wagner had put together and that's the vision that he presented to me and to others when he was recruiting. And uh, you know, this is not one of those situations where you start a company and you do something and then you find something else and you keep pivoting, okay? He had it right and, uh, and we've just been uh, pursuing that direction uh, ever since. Um, did I mention I'm not a businessman? <laughs> I had to look up TAM. These guys say TAM this, TAM that. Total addressable market, uh, 280 billion. Some of that's, most of that's labor, but they're already spending some money on material handling equipment. So it all adds up to $280 billion a year. I guess that's a, a big number. Uh, there's one thing that I think is very interesting about this, which is the growth of e-commerce. E so I wanted to dwell on that for just a moment. Uh, we all know it's growing. We all know it's had an enormous impact, um, driving retailers under, for example, changing the way many of us shop. Um, and so here's a question to, I, I want to ask you. What percentage of retail do you think is right now being, uh, falling under e-commerce? Is it 80%, 50%? Do you have any idea? Oh, you guys are uh, you guys are undershooting. So uh, good job. <laughs> it is somewhere around 15. Here's the here's the actual chart. So when you see these, this chart, usually, of course, you know they're they're just doing the vertical axis, like from here to there. Uh, so you can see the exponential looking uh, curve. So it is increasing. It is accelerating. But it is, you're right, it's actually still very small as a percentage, which means that this process can go on a long time, okay? It's not going to be over tomorrow. Uh, so that's the, kind of the last point I wanted to make with the numbers. Yes, sir. That is, I believe, dollars, but uh, it doesn't say dollars, it just says percent. I think it's dollars. So automobiles, yeah. Oh, 
Oh my goodness. Keep an eye on them. See if they start uh, signing off now that they see what I look like. Okay. <laughs> I, sorry, you all were uh, not seeing my image. Uh, I, I hope this is an improvement. <laughs> um, thanks, Brian. Okay, well, uh, let's see if I can get this. Okay, so I want to talk about manipulation. Um, what is the relationship of logistics to manipulation? Well, okay, what is manipulation? Some definitions are that uh, manipulation is what you do with your hands. But, you know, I don't think this is manipulation. I, I don't think that's the right definition. I think it's moving stuff around, controlling things in the world, not necessarily just with your hands, right? You can do it with your feet. Uh, you can do it with a forklift, uh, with chopsticks, right? So it's, it's controlling stuff, moving stuff around. What is logistics? Logistics is moving stuff from the producers to the consumer, so it is a type of manipulation, okay? It just, it just fits. If you take a, a step back and think about the big picture, it is a manipulation problem. You've got all this stuff that's uh, coming from factories and farms, okay? And it has to move to all of us. There is this distribution network. So there are nodes for producers and nodes for consumers, and then there are nodes for distribution centers and retail stores and so forth, right? And all the stuff is flowing through that network. And um, so um, one way to look about th at this is to follow one object and think about what's happening. So let's say you wanted a mint, okay, one little mint. And... Uh, um, I've got one in my bag here, but in a moment. So let's say I'm in Atlanta, uh, uh, where, which is unfortunately, not unfortunately, which is now where I'm spending a lot of my time. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, you want a mint in Atlanta, but the mint factory is in Minneapolis, which is like a thousand miles away, right? So what do you do? You could call up the factory and say, I want a mint. And at the factory, they say, no problem. We've got a courier waiting downstairs. We'll run the mint out to him. Uh, and he'll drive it over to you, and you'll have it in a day or two, and it'll cost you about a thousand bucks, okay? Because a courier is something like a dollar a mile. So uh, that's not a very good option, okay? Actually, a mint costs a, a lot less than that. So how, how does that happen? It's a big ride-sharing scheme, okay? You don't hand one mint to a courier. You have a truck. That courier has a truck, and on that truck is like a billion mints or, you know, a lot of other stuff, not just mints, right? And now that mint's going to go from, from node to node in the distribution network, and at every node, it might be getting off of one truck and getting onto another truck, and when it's working well, uh, every truck is, is, is fully loaded, and so the cost of the trip is uh, amortized over all of the stuff that's in the truck, and, and that means that you can actually get that mint for three cents. It's, it's, it's an amazing uh, savings. It's actually quite similar to the transportation network, if you think about that, right? When you're traveling uh, on, a, on an air trip, you're going from uh, hub to hub, right? But you don't have to have machinery or, or people move you from one container to another. You move yourself, right? You're intelligent enough and mobile enough to do that you know, sorting at every node on your own, which you know, suggests if you, if you want to think about whether we can learn something from one process and apply it to the other, you know, that suggests that it would be better if our mints were intelligent and mobile, although I think it's going to be hard to get them for three cents then. Uh, or you could try and go the other way and ask, how could we be more efficient with human beings? Right, the human passengers should be packed into smaller containers, and then those containers should be loaded like, uh, like they load the cargo on an airplane and then sorted out it from hub to hub. Neither of these ideas is going to go anywhere. But One thing that happens to do this efficiently is that they do use uh, a succession of containers. Right? So if you open up one of these trucks, you don't see a billion mints in there. right? So they put the mint in a roll, the roll's in a box, the box is in a case, case is in a pallet, pallet's on a truck, right? The truck is a box, it's just a box with wheels. 
So, so it's a succession of containers, and, um, and that makes it, that gives you much more flexibility, makes it practical for them to uh, do the sorting at the nodes of the network. By the way, when I first, uh, when I was first preparing this talk, you know, I was kind of proud of this, and then I thought, then I remembered, oh wait, I'm the newbie, I, 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 I'm just learning about logistics. Obviously, these guys know that, that this is what they're doing. And so I went to that textbook, that online textbook, and sure enough, he had a figure, uh, they had a figure, they cited a, a, a naval, uh, a navy document that has a figure that's quite similar to mine. So intellectually, what I brought to this process was uh, to use a mint rather than a paper clip in the, in the illustration. Um, but let's see, yeah, back to the mint. So what happens? So you're at the factory, they put the mint into a roll, put the roll into a box, put the box into a case, put the case to a pallet, pallet into a truck, okay? Truck drives, so this, the, the, the horizontal axis is space, okay? Distance along the network. The vertical axis is how deeply nested is the mint. Um, so I'm gonna call all of the downward things puts and all the upward things picks, okay? So it's put, 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 put. It goes to a DC, so this is DC1 here. And what happens at that DC? Maybe just making it up, you know, you, somebody pulls the pallet off the truck, pulls a case off the pallet. These cases are sorted to different pallets and those pallets are sorted to different trucks. Uh, Oh, that's supposed to be drive, not, well, it's, a, it's sortation as well, isn't it? Anyway, uh, maybe the second DC, they just put the cases on the truck. They skip the pallet stage. A lot of times you see a truck at a store, it won't have pallets, it'll just have cases. Maybe it goes to the store, and when you get to the store, the people in the back of the store take the case out of the truck, they pull the box out of the uh, case, and they put that box next to the cash register, right? And then what happens, you come along and you pull a roll out of the box and then you do the final pick of the mint out of the roll and there you go, that's your mint. So that's sort of the process. I've left out a lot, right? If you think about, uh, you know, you, a lot of the stuff at the store you're putting into another container, a grocery cart. And then when you go through the checkout, you know, it's getting picked out of the grocery cart on the conveyor, then it goes in, into the bag, and then the bag goes into, back into the cart, and the cart goes, you know, it goes on and on. And uh, I, I think it's useful actually to look at that whole process and ask, uh, you know, where, where the gains can be made. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot, there's a lot yet to be covered there. And it's just really one little area of this chart that uh, where automation has, has happened so far. So now, if you look at that process, what you see is two manipulation challenges that are uh, so very well known to us. Uh, we're all like genius manipulators, we're human beings. You're awesome at manipulation. You may not think about it that much. Um, but we do talk about it, and so for example, when somebody's talking about uh, the problem of nested containment, uh, you might you say, it's, you know, it's like Russian dolls. That's kind of the iconic version of that problem. Or if you're talking about things that are packed so densely that it's hard to get your fingers in there to pick them out, people will say, you know, it's like getting the first cigar out of a cigar box. So these are iconic manipulation challenges, and if you think about that process we were just looking at, it has both of these, right? Logistics is taking both of these challenges and sort of interleaving them. Um, and it has to be that way for efficiency, right? There's, there's a good reason for it. You want those trucks to, to run as densely packed as possible. You want the storage in the warehouse to be as dense as possible. And you know what? It's even true in your own, own home. Go look in your home, okay? And, and you'll have to look at things more like an engineer, you know, and less like a homebody. But, you know, the cabinets are boxes, and the silverware trays are boxes. All of these things are containers of one form or another. And you, you pull out, and, you know, you're probably pulling out a box, right? At another level of containment. 
Uh, and when you're all done, you'll repack everything. Because if everything were out in your kitchen, you would, you know, life would be impossible, right? So uh, it, it's, it's, it's unavoidable, uh, these problems. So let's look at what happens with, with picking. Um, when I first drew this slide, I said, well, you know, here's the easy case because there's no clutter, unless you count the table itself. Um, but you know what? That's actually not easy. It looks easy here because this is like what you see in a factory where a lot of times the grippers are made to fit the object. But really, grasping an isolated object is something that's occupied manipulation research for decades, right? It's actually, uh, to solve it in a good way is quite hard. Uh, it just doesn't look that hard in the picture I drew. Um, now, when people wanted to talk about a more challenging version of it with clutter, okay, they would think of this uh, random bin. So people talk about random bin picking. If you have a, some stuff scattered around in a bin, now you've got this, uh, what we thought of was high clutter. And, um, you know, in my own publications, you, you can see papers where I talk about this as a high clutter uh, scenario. But this is actually modest clutter, okay? And I didn't realize that until thinking about what's going on in logistics. This, this is the high clutter situation. In fact, I'm not even showing the nested containment thing here, right? Getting one mint out of a truck, that's a high clutter, right? That's the extreme. Uh, now this may not look so challenging because you're a human being and so these things actually seem quite simple. I brought some actual mints here, which, uh, if, how do we do the mints without uh, violating the COVID? We can't? <laughs> I didn't hear what, what did Gene say? If you have enough for one closed packet, Oh, I, I don't. You'll have to organize and, uh, and elect representatives. <laughs> so this is what's sitting at the cash register. We don't, oh, thanks. This is what's sitting at the cash register, right? And you reach in and you grab it and you pull it out. It's like, that's not a problem. What's the big problem? Okay. Well, uh, you're actually, you might be changing the shape of your fingers to get them in there, right? And, uh, uh, and stretching the box or stretching the package or there's all kinds of things that you could. <laughs> Didn't I mention that humans are genius manipulators? <laughs> I ended up with uh, an additional role. <laughs> awesome. Uh, if you, uh, you want to see uh, you know, how difficult it is for a robot, one thing you can do is get one of these little toy grippers and then see. And you could still do it because you have human perception, human intelligence. You can still do it, I think. You, know, you can work at it and you'll, you'll get it done. But you get an, a more of an... Yeah, I dropped it. You get more of an appreciation of how hard it is for a robot to do this. And I know many of you know this because many of you have been working on these kind of problems. Uh, so this is, this is really insanely difficult. That's picking. Um, I want to show you a video of uh, a demonstration of picking that we're doing with the uh, vacuum effector at Berkshire Gray. And if you've worked with vacuum, uh, you will be surprised because we're doing things here that people say cannot be done. So one thing is, usually to pick bags, you, you would get a special vacuum gripper. To pick something like that, that baseball container, it had seams and it just grabbed right over the seams. And, so the, and, and, and this is a bath sponge. You're not getting a seal there, okay? And so the usual logic, the usual engineering for vacuum gripping is not in play here. Okay, this is different and um, and I can't tell you, you know, all of the magic <laughs> ingredients of this, uh, but it is picking almost anything uh, with vacuum. Uh, so that's the picking. Let's look at pudding. Uh, okay. I mean, this really is easy. I can't figure out how to say that that's hard. It's easy if you're not worried about damage, okay? So if you're going to drop, you know, if I wanted to put a coin on the floor, I wouldn't bother to bend over or anything. I would just drop it, right? Uh, but if that were an egg or if it were a package, 
and uh, you know, with let's say an iPhone in it, or you know, something that where people are sensitive to damage, then it's different. It has to be placed carefully. So it's easy or it's hard, depending on that. Uh, you know, this is still easy. Dropping into a bin is is still pretty easy, and and that's really why um, warehouse automation became sort of accessible to the technology that, that we could produce. Um, and then we're working towards this one, right? But again, we're talking about something that's, that's uh, well, you know, how is that gripper going to do that, <laughs> right? Uh, a human could do it even with a, a gripper like that, but it's not easy. So uh, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, putting things that's, that, are, that are doing at Berkshire Gray. Uh, so this is like, uh, could be in the back of a grocery uh, where there are these micro fulfillment centers sometimes. You'll notice it's pausing in between the pick and the put. That's so that a camera can get a good look at it to get a very precise estimate of the pose relative to the gripper. Okay, it just needs to have better information so that it can put it in the bag uh, without having it catch the side of the bag or or end up on top of something tall. Is this cycling? <laughs> That's enough, isn't it? <laughs> Here's another one. This one you'll see is uh, being uh, careful. So it's not dropping at all. And there's also, it's packing things a little bit more densely. Uh, so again, it's pausing to get the uh, pose in hand. And then you can see it's actually, you know, the final drop is a fraction of an inch, just a few millimeters. So a very, very careful placement with a fair degree of, of density. Yeah. That happens here. It needs to move things out. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good one question. Way, one way thing, or is it? I mean, a human would. There's been some research on that. Um, uh, Costa Becris at uh, uh, what's the name of that university in New Jersey? Is it, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Rutgers. Rutgers. Yeah, yeah. He's done some work on that. Um, do any backtracking? Does it? I don't believe it does. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Um, but yeah, that is the thing that. Let's see. And and then besides picking and putting, there's sorting. Well, sorting is just sort of discretionary transportation. Um, but you know what? That is uh, an opportunity to look at another system. So this is a system that does. Uh, sort of order fulfillment for stores, so store replenishment. So when a store sells something, then they order a replacement for that something from the regional distribution center. And so this is doing order fulfillment at the regional distribution center. So every one of these gray bins is inventory that came out of an automated storage and retrieval system. And then the arm is transferring the item from the inventory and putting it in the bucket of the linear sort wing. That linear sort wing's similar to the one we had at the FedEx facility. And then in this case, every one of those bins represents a, uh, a different destination, a different store that uh, ordered that object. Yeah, this is, uh, this is at a customer facility. And all of this Berkshire Gray designed, including, for example, the caps and the uh, floor of those boxes. Okay, an empty box, it turns out, news to me, <laughs> an empty box doesn't do very well on a conveyor, all right? And so uh, you want the, uh, the floors, those gray floors for that. And then the cap is a way of controlling the flaps of the box and also a way to make it so, so that you can get more stuff in the box and not worry about overfilling. All of that stuff is, uh, comes into play. It's all part of the system. 
So, um, um, and that's a good point for me to talk about the holistic approach. So part of the vision is not to sell components, right? We're not selling motion planning software. We're not selling vision. We're not selling control. We're not selling robots. We're selling systems, right? That include all of those things. And uh, uh, why is that? Well, if you're just building one thing, you don't have as much, you don't have as much freedom to, uh, to build a great system. So the analogy that, that uh, I like is, you know, imagine if Henry Ford had said, oh, uh, I'm going to automate a horse, and then we'll have a horseless carriage, okay? And, you know, when we talk to customers at warehouses, sometimes they'll say, uh, you know, see uh, that uh, worker over there is doing induction into our sorting system. Can you replace that person with a robot? And uh, our answer is usually no. Okay, well, that's not what we want to do, okay? Uh, it would be analogous to Henry Ford saying he's going to replace the horse with a, with a robot. Instead, what you want to do is, uh, you know, throw all the cards up in the air, right? Consider everything uh, uh, an option and optimize the whole, all components of the system so that they work well together, and that's how you get the most value. So that's why, that's why we're looking at these whole systems. Um, Here's one more. Uh, now, I have a couple of videos here about mobile robots. So uh, um, we're using mobile robots to sort things, to do temporary storage. Uh, this system is uh, not mass storage. Okay, There is an automated storage and retrieval system off to the side. Uh, you can think of this as cache memory. Okay, when uh, so when the orders start coming in, the storage system starts delivering inventory out to this uh, flex field, and these mobile robots start grabbing it and storing it on shelves and then carrying it to the robot, and then they're also carrying empty cases to the robot, and the robot's doing the transfer of inventory into the empty cases. Now, um, one of the things about this is that you can uh, push the boxes out of the facility in the right order, in an aisle-ready order. And so what that means is that the retailer, uh, when these things come off the truck, they're in these carts, those carts go right to the aisle, and a worker then moves that uh, cart up the aisle and takes stuff off, and it goes right into the, uh, you know, it's in the correct order. Uh, which ends up being absurdly important to the retailer. It, it could take them uh, something like nine hours to unload a truck uh, in the old way, and uh, something like an hour or less to do it now. So uh, that turns out to be uh, of great value to them. So that's the FlexBot system. And you can see it's got this automated uh, machinery for getting stuff on and off of the field. And uh, there's the robot picker moving stuff from inventory to, to output bins. The uh, uh, second one is, uh, this is a second generation of the mobile robots, and uh, they just wanted to brag about how this can pick, uh, carry all kinds of things, not just boxes and bins. So uh, in warehouses, you know, some things aren't very convenient to put in a bin. Uh, a canoe is the canonical example, although there's no, no canoe here. Um, sometimes these are called the big uglies. Uh, and you can see that the, the idea is the robot can carry a lot of different things, not just stuff in bins and boxes. And what are the square patches on the floor? Navigation. What about the previous one, the bronze? <laughs> Oh, uh, the previous generation had uh, something that's akin to railroad tracks. It was essentially a sort of XY railroad track thing. And, uh, um, and so, you know, the wheel, so it, it was very easy for it to go in straight lines. It was also kind of noisy, and ultimately we went in a different direction. So, uh, implica implications for robotics research. Uh, I was talking earlier about uh, how important an application automated manufacturing had been. 
And I think you can say the same thing about logistics going forward. So why is that? Well, one of the great things about manufacturing as an application area is, is that there were robots already there doing it. Okay, so now if you make some advance in the technology, uh, no matter how small, you know, if it is easily deployed at scale in manufacturing, it will be deployed, okay? And so the transition from results to application can be uh, uh, very quick in automated manufacturing. If you're working in, um, on, uh, let's say, building a robot butler, that's not the same, right? A minor improvement in your robot butler is not going to see a commercial application until somebody makes a huge advance in, in robotic butlering. So, um, um, so that's one thing that makes it a, a great candidate for, uh, uh, for our interest. Um, and let's see, you know, obviously, I guess it's obvious from the talk. I mean, I think you get, every time you look at a different application, you get sort of new perspectives, new ideas. Honestly, I used to think, I, I, I used to be really uninterested in people that just wanted to grab things and then drop them in a bin. I, I thought, you know, what is the use of that? Who is ever going to use that? And uh, obviously I've changed my mind. <laughs> that turns out to be very useful. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the big question remaining is whether it's going to be a great source of funding. And, uh, you know, I would hope that someday uh, the military would be uh, supporting this because the military certainly cares about logistics. And, uh, uh, and then there's the possibilities. I mean, NSF does fund some work on this, um, but you know, certainly the possibility for growing funds in the public sector and uh, and who knows? You know, Amazon they've they've got some support for funding uh, for research, and uh, hopefully, you know, Berkshire Gray when it reaches a comparable scale will be doing that too. So that's uh, more of a hope. Um, if you want to learn more. There was a recent article in uh, Materials Handling, Modern Materials Handling. These guys are SoftBank uh, engineers, uh, but you can see they're deploying our systems in Japan. Um, the system, uh, which is known affectionately at Berkshire Gray as Unit 3003, one of our babies. One last video to show you with the music this time, uh, just so we can go out with a bang. Is that too loud? And all of the systems in that video, uh, that was actually not at customer facilities. That was in the Innovation Center, uh, which is in Bedford, Mass., and where they uh, take customers sometimes to either test the technology against their products or uh, discuss other technology. So anyway, that's everything I have. Thanks a lot uh, again. And um, thank you. And how does this work now? Questions? This is Shah Audience ask questions. Hey, this is great. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about is the challenges with respect to maybe uh, doing, let's say, recycling, right? So if you have these clippers and picking up and sorting things, 
there are some robotics companies that are doing recycling, right? Are there bigger challenges there, or are they similar to the warehouse challenges? What What do you think? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, one thing that was a touchstone when uh, at the beginning. So, uh, you know, I, I had I would have these conversations with Tom Wagner where I would say, you know, you, we can't build a robot that can pick up everything, and he would say, it doesn't have to pick up everything. It just has to pick up the things that are in stores, which are packaged, designed so that humans can pick them up. So as long as you can pick up everything that a human can pick up, you're good. <laughs> okay, it's still it's still way too high a bar. But um, uh, I'm just thinking that uh, recycles might break that uh, part of the formula. So when something's presented on a shelf at a retail store, you know, it is designed to be easily handled uh, and perceived by the shopper. Uh, and I'm guessing recycling isn't quite the same. But with that, with that uh, exception, I think actually the system would be amenable to, to working in that application. This is a follow-up to your boss's comment. So, so you, you heard of AMP Robotics, AMP Robotics. And you know, it's one of Joel Gordick's students uh, started that company, um, Montoya. And I think the problem they're having with their system is plus two, two thoughts. One is they actually went in and replaced a component that designed a new system, which has its trade-offs. Um, and then the other thing is their suction cups get dirty a lot. So, so yeah. I, I suspect you figured something out that they... That That's going to be a problem. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, you know, things get worn, things get dirty, things break. You know, you have to engineer for all of that. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that involves a human coming and taking care of it, right? So. If you're, you know, if a bottle of uh, baby powder breaks open in a bin, right? That's that's a, that's a problem. And to be clear, I wasn't implying anything about their financial model. The yeah. cup's breaking. They're actually doing well. So, so that's good. Getting cost effective. To replace their data. I saw a hand back there. Um, th thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit of a cop-out question, kind of like what's next, but. Uh, I guess at your time at Berkshire Gray, what's something technical that like surprised you, like a manipulation thing you learned there? Well, uh, um, I mean, I was surprised that you know picking pink things out of one bin and putting them in another was so great. <laughs> um, Let's see, the problem with this, so, I mean, there's, there's a surprise every day. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you something that, that, that was interesting. So one thing I've wondered is whether uh, competitors in this area might like to interfere with each other by designing packaging and promoting packaging that gives the other systems problems, right? <laughs> and, uh, one time a package, uh, we were looking at some packaging that really made me wonder about that. Uh, if you know Otter, the company Otter, they make boxes for, they make cases for uh, phones and similar things. And the packaging that they were shipping these things in was a, a clamshell. So you take two pieces of cardboard and you stick them together with the product in between. So the result is very, very flat. Okay, so if you're using, and, and broad, so if you're using fingers, you know, it's going to be hard to pick up, which fortunately we weren't. But they were also using, the cardboard they were using is the kind that's corrugated cardboard but missing one face, right? So you have all these corrugations. So, uh, uh, you know, presumably designed to defeat vacuum. Uh, but actually, no, we can handle it. Uh, and the third thing was that it was a very flat black. Uh, in order to defeat the vision system. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. That's not exactly a good answer to your question, but <laughs> yeah. Um, can you speak to the design of the, the sort of like a comb and tooth um, conveyor robots? I, I felt like the teeth were very like far, far spaced, spaced far apart, and I don't know if I would put my whole fish on that. Huh. Are there any issues with that? I don't know. 
I, I didn't work on that. I was, uh, I was close with the gang uh, that designed the, the, uh, the first generation, uh, and then not uh, really involved the second generation. Uh, I'm going to say, it's fine, don't worry, these guys are, uh, these guys, these people are awesome engineers and, you know, a lot of them came from here, so obviously they, they did a great job. <laughs> the goldfish looked happy, but uh, it wasn't a bowl, wasn't it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll take one off of the screen here. Give Weezel permission to speak to me. <laughs> Let's oh, get. Yeah, uh, hey, Matt. Hey. Uh, yes, actually, um, I'm curious about. Uh, I, I think your architecture is pretty awesome, uh, which makes me think uh, it'll be a very interesting experience for me to um, get an internship here. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of interested in you. Yes! I, I noticed that your website is full engineer, full time, full -time engineer, but uh, it'll be interesting if you take an internship, so would that be possible? Um, <laughs> send me an email. I, I don't know. There's, there's, uh, there should be an internship program, and I'm sure there will be one. I just don't know if we've gotten that uh, rolling yet. So send me an email. Uh, thank you. Send me an email. Right. <laughs> yes. David who's Berkshire Gray? Berkshire Gray, yeah, you know, uh, uh, there's no... There's no legend that goes with that. <laughs> the Berkshire Mountains are, you know, in Massachusetts. Wagner's, you know, the headquarters is in Massachusetts. Gray, I don't know why. Gray with the British spelling instead of the American spelling because it makes us sound smarter, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you shared with us, like, the insane problem of a very highly cluttered box. Um, in order to solve that problem, would you say like the bottleneck is more of like the uh, the end effector design, or more of kind of like the reasoning behind how to approach it, how to unpack? I think it's mostly the latter. I think uh, so. The question was, you know, looking at some of the challenging uh, manipulation problems that I showed, you know, what what does it take to solve them? And does it take better effectors, or does it take more intelligence or perception? Uh, and I think the answer is intelligence and perception. Um, if, you, if you put uh, a really crummy effector in the hands of a human being, they will do amazing things with it. And, uh, and if you look at what happens with uh, bio-inspired effectors in, uh, being operated by a robot, uh, you know, the effector doesn't solve the problem, right? It's, uh, you know, that's why it's still a research problem. We're still figuring that out. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I have a question about, like, for these kind of industrial applications, uh, how do you find the balance between um, kind of improving your direct manipulation strategies versus being willing to modify the environment to make the problem easier? Um, I think Mark and I are thinking about some of the things in this because, for me, tackling that, that dense, like, picking problem I wouldn't try and pick it out, I'd just take the whole box and turn it over. Yes. Um, but obviously that requires that you have a tray and you're being willing to modify the environment that way. Yeah. So how do you find a balance between which problems you should solve with manipulation versus which problems you solve by modifying them to begin yeah. with? I, I think the easy answer is you explore all the possibilities and you take the one that's the best. So, you know, uh, you know, we have looked at, you know, would it make sense to dump everything out? And, you know, um, you know, you look at everything. Uh, and, you know, that's the joy of the holistic approach, uh, that you have that much control uh, over the context as well as the robot. Uh, and, of course, you know, I'm aware that in, in, in academia, uh, a lot of people see that almost as disqualifying. They want robots that work in unstructured environments and not environments where, you know, that can be engineered to simplify the task. Uh, but then, you know, a kitchen a actually isn't all that unstructured. Uh, it's certainly less structured than, you know, what I've been showing you, but, um, um, but you know, there's, there's certain, there's a great deal of regularity in the design of kit kitchens as well. 
and for similar reasons, so that they can be efficient to work in. So uh, uh, I forgot the question. Now I'm just rambling. But <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. You, you you do both if you can. You know, to the extent that you have the option to play with the context. Now uh, you know things show up in trucks. Things show up in bins. Uh, you know, we don't have unlimited uh, ability to dictate to people how they're going to package their things, right? And uh, or we would say, you know, we would just tell them no cigar boxes, you know, <laughs> uh, or you have to grease your cigars, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think I. Ha who's had their hand up the longest? <laughs> yeah, I can. Ask. So along the same line. I no, no, you okay. and then you. Okay. So along the same line, I have a question. Uh, so all the designs that have like four plates or knives are made for humans specifically. So do you think like similar changes need to happen in uh, for robots to manipulate like a knife or a plate? So like, you're, you're like, asking here, I think, it should, should they be changing designs of things to accommodate robots? Uh, yeah. To an extent, <laughs> you know, we're facing, uh, you know, we're, faking, we're, we're facing the forces of marketing, right? So if, if we tell somebody, we don't like your package, it has seams that make it more difficult for a vacuum, or, you know, it's hard to find a grasp on it, or we don't like that color, or it, it's hard for our vision systems, they're going to turn around and they're people are going to tell them that it sells product. And, uh, and that's hard to fight. So, you know, there are definitely limits in our ability to do that. Now, if you're talking about going up the chain a little bit, right? So instead of the mint or the roll, let's talk about the box or the case or the pallet, okay? And there, we should have a lot more freedom. beginning, you said, hey, we're not going to focus on the component which we can change the system, but it's interesting to see where do you draw a box around the system, and, and I think part of what he's saying is, well, maybe the box is a little bit bigger, and, and I feel like your answer is, is you know, market forces are, are dictating where you draw that box, which, is, which I think is interesting. Yeah, it's a challenge, and, uh, and this is just something I've thought about and speculated about. I'm not, I'm not talking about any process, any discussion that I've had. Uh, with any customers, but this is sort of the thinking you go through when you're trying to think about the different options. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I have a few questions. One is regarding how user research has impacted the solutions that you have been delivering, like from design team or user research team, if there is any in workshop, uh, how that has impacted the solutions that has been delivered. And the second question is, Technologically, what is the next big challenge in warehouse automation that people are usually uh, would be working on? Well, I let me do the second question because I didn't quite understand the first question, and then you ask you can re-ask if you want. Um, but next big challenges. So one thing that's interesting about warehouses is that we think that they're all that's happening is product is flowing through them. Uh, but one thing that's interesting in warehouses is that sometimes they kind of tread across the line and do things that really should belong in the factory. Like, uh, you know, if you click the box uh, at Amazon to say this is a gift, you know, they'll throw in, in, in gift wrap, a gift bag or something, you know. They should put it in the gift bag for you, right? <laughs> Um, and so that's a little bit of assembly. And there are other things like that, right? When you order flowers, uh, somebody's assembling them to order. And things like that can happen not just in your local florist, but in a distribution center. Or when you say, I want this to be, uh, what's the word, you know, I want my initials carved in it. I Embroidery, or yeah, you know, so there, there are things like that that can happen at the distribution center. Uh, what are other examples like that? You might imagine that we could be assembling airplane food, trays for airplanes to do airplane catering and things like that. So 
Uh, I think there's no actual real line between logistics and manufacturing, and I think uh, you know it's interesting to see how, uh, and, and some interesting challenges I think associated with uh, uh, doing manufacturing with this system, simple kinds of assembly. But what was the first question? How did the office? So, is there a team in Berkshire who is doing like interviews or studying the space already? What kind of materials are being handled? What customers really want? Creating personas or things like that? Is that a part of? Uh, I research? don't know. <laughs> sure. Um, I think you've had your hand up quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you for the talk today, first and foremost. Sure. Uh, I, I liked how you phrased logistics as a form of manipulation from the producer to the customer. And I think uh, you, you have ex you're witnessing a lot of success in, in the middle part of that, which is inside the warehouse. Do you think that uh, the time is right to take the lessons you've learned and the technology you've developed to then take, to tackle the last mile side of things? Do you uh -huh. think manipulation is ready there? Uh, do you think, and if we're not ready, then what's missing to take that same technology and put it outside the warehouse? Yeah, the last mile. Um, I, you know, I, I know nothing about it. Uh, I hear people talk about it. It sounds, uh, you know, a, a, a different dimension of insanity, uh, the, the problems that people talk about there. You know, I've just thought about it a little bit. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's smart to think about the big picture. And so, like, you know, how would you, how would you take the consumer all the way out, you know? Well, uh, are we going to have robots that go into your house and stock your refrigerator? Uh, I don't know. That doesn't sound so great. Maybe your refrigerator is against the outside wall and it has two doors, and one of them opens outside and one opens inside, and the robot goes and sticks the stuff into the outside door. I'm sure people are working on that. So I don't know. I've, I've, I've thought about things like that, and that's about all I have to say about it. Sorry. Did, was that a comment back then? That's how they used to do milk. There's houses in Pittsburgh that's that have right. a hole in them. You're right. That was for people to just drop the milk in your house. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for the great talk. I wanted to ask um, if, so um, when you have containers that are temperature sensitive, like cartons of milk or cheese or frozen stuff, so does, does Berkshire Gray Systems deal with those kind of containers as well? Because I'd yeah. imagine that you need to have refrigeration systems in your warehouses. And yeah, they, yeah, they do. And uh, yeah, that's, that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you have to test things, obviously. You have to test things in that kind of environment. So, you know, we've had uh, refrigerator trucks in our parking lot and, you know, systems kind of tailored, you know, so that they can fit inside that environment and operate uh, in order to uh, identify uh, anything that uh, might be at risk there. I mean, yeah. Okay. Uh, so am I supposed to stop? Uh, well, okay. Two more quick questions. So, so John, <laughs> and then we'll wait in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Jonathan, you mentioned the existence of a lot of structure. Right? So yeah. Um, the different manipulation systems you showed. Um, this may be a very broad question, but let's say you deploy one in a certain warehouse for one company. If you're going to do another one in another place, how much of the software do you reuse and, and what parts of it do you have to like write again? Like what's the yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, uh, all I know is that they're, uh, they're very cognizant of these issues. Now, one thing that is a, a big issue is sort of brownfield versus greenfield. Uh, so if, if you're going to build a warehouse, um, you have options that you don't necessarily have if you're trying to fit a system into an existing warehouse. And so it's been a big uh, factor in the design of the, of the systems to make them um, you know, configurable in a way to fit whatever space is available and to make them compact enough that you don't have to like take up, you know, uh, you know, 10 square miles, you know, to sort products. Uh, so there's a kind of scalability and modularity that, that, that work there. So that's the physical side, but you're asking about software, right? Yeah, like the robotic stack. Yeah, so um, 
I know, that I'm going to add, I'm going to change this talk, I'm going to add software engineering to the list of things that I know nothing about, okay? There are a lot of people at Berkshire Gray that know a lot about software engineering, and I don't. But there is an architecture, and there are these processes, and, uh, and they work real hard on that. And as far as I can tell, they're doing well. That's about the only answer I can give you for that. I think that's pretty much answers my question. My, my question was about the generalizability, like from how much the difference, uh, how much the difference is between the innovation center to the customized uh, design for a certain customer, and yeah. how may it be generalizable to other customers. Yeah. But I think you're, yeah. I'll, I'll say one more thing about it, though. Uh, I mean, it varies. So, um, you know, some people, some businesses can use a system that's uh, almost off the shelf, I would say, you know, from the innovation center. Uh, if you do have a you know, 10 square mile facility, and if you want to do uh, order fulfillment for a thousand retail stores in the area, and, you know, and so on and so on, uh, you know, in that case, um, you know, they'll, we'll build something that, uh, engineer something for, for that facility. And one of the most interesting things uh, for me was watching this in the beginning. So one of the things that, that, that Berkshire Gray did was to identify some sort of key strategic partners that would work for, with us over the long term. And these systems were developed uh, for those customers. And so, you know, we would do the brainstorming thing and uh, look at, at many different possibilities and uh, do simulations at every different kind of level, you know, event-driven simulations to look at uh, whether it matches the statistics of that customer, the velocity with which uh, product flows in and out, how many different uh, units, do, how many different stock keeping units, SKUs do they have. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, gradually, with them, uh, narrow down to a system that might be one of the systems that you saw there. So, uh, you know, that was the rule rather than the exception in the beginning. And, you know, as time goes on, it, it becomes uh, the exception, but it still happens. Okay, so uh, let's once again uh, thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions?